I trust that I express the sentiments of all of you who've gathered here this morning when I say I'm so thankful for these young men that are coming along, like Braden Shelley. I, I just know he's going to be an outstanding student here in the School of Preaching. He has a lovely wife, and so we're thankful for him. There's some of us who are getting quite older. I've been preaching the gospel now over 60 years, and it doesn't seem possible. But time does have a way of marching on. But a young man like Brother Adam Moore, who was here uh, leading us in prayer, I know of his work. He preaches in Fordland, Missouri, does an outstanding job, and I'm thankful for, for him. And for the one who's going to be our speaker, Brother Andy Burns, who is a graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching and has done an excellent job uh, in his uh, uh, ministry thus far, and I, there's no doubt in my mind he's going to continue to do so. He's currently the preacher for the Sunset Church of Christ in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Uh, Fran, my wife, was reared in Carlsbad, and so from time to time we go out there to her old homestead, and, and uh, the last couple of times we've been out there while we've attended the Sunset Congregation and heard Andy Burns preach, and I, I just sat there so happy thinking, well, he was in school at Brown Trail, and now is preaching for a fine congregation. He's a 1960, 1996 graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching, and he went ahead to earn his bachelor's degree in Bible from Oklahoma Christian College. And uh, also, he obtained a master's of divinity degree in ministerial leadership from Southern Christian University. His wife's name is Terry, and she's such a vivacious person. You, you need to meet her, and uh, it's a joy to be around her. And they have one of their two sons with them, uh, here at the uh, lectureship. I think it's the youngest of the two. They have a son named Austin, and Ryan, I think, is the one that's with us. And uh, uh, Andy has a real passion for evangelism, reaching out to the lost and all, and I think he's just the perfect one to uh, address the subject because uh, just as was brought out in the last lesson, people can live in sin and yet they can live in righteousness. So he's going to bring a lesson that I know will be good. Andy, you have 38 minutes. Well, good, good morning. I guess it's good, good more afternoon, whichever one it is. It's a, uh, I've got to say that light is bright. Wow, I, I didn't know how bright it was until you get up here. But uh, it's good to be here. I so appreciate Maxie giving me the honor of, of being here and being a part of this lectureship. I remember being here in 95 and 96 and uh, going through, uh, it seems like a longer lectureship than what is now, and uh, lots of good lessons, lots of encouraging lessons. Um, before I get on with my lesson, I did want to make a couple of comments to the uh, current preaching students. And I know when I left Brown Trail, these comments would have helped me. And so I wanted to share these with those of you that this may apply to. Uh, number one, if you're going through Brown Trail right now and you're kind of starry-eyed and having some challenges, and uh, if you're a preacher student, would you put your hands up? All right, there we go. So it's, it's you guys. Um, if you feel lost right now, just chill. It's going to be okay. You'll get there. I had a friend of mine in preaching school tell me uh, it's going to be okay. You'll get there. And so uh, if you're in those shoes, calm down going to be okay. Uh, the second thing I would encourage you with is if you are married, uh, as you're here and when you leave, uh, take care of your sweet wife. Uh, encourage her. Pray for her because she's living in a whole different world as a preacher's wife than you are as a preacher. And so take care of her and uh, take her out often. Uh, bless her in that way. Have some dates and just enjoy the time with her. Uh, understand where she is as well. And uh, the third thing is, when you get into a new congregation, whether you are, uh, hi, I'm sorry, I didn't expect it. Did you see these two, Terry? Um, Dee Dee and Randy, oh, wonderful people. So glad y'all are here. Uh, okay, if, uh, if uh, when you get into your new church or new congregation, um, don't try and change too much stuff. Just get there and enjoy yourself and preach God's word. So I wanted to share those three things with you. 
If you open up your Bibles to uh, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse, we're going to begin in verse 5. And I want to share something with you before we start our lesson this morning. I want you to imagine you're outside working in the yard, and you come in and you want a glass of water. You're parched, you're tired. Now, if it's okay, I'm going to walk a little bit around here. I, I'm a walking preacher. Um, so you come in, and you're, you're tired, you're thirsty, you're sweaty, and you want to drink a water, and you're parched. And you might even drink a couple of, of, of glasses of water because you're really tired, you're really thirsty. Which water would you rather drink? You want this one, right? How many, how many of y'all would, would drink this? Anybody? You want this one, right? I mean, it's got the earth in it. Man comes from dust. Wouldn't this be good? No, no, no. You want this one, don't you? That's the one that you want. And yet, one of the things we need to recognize as we walk as Christians, and even as we look at the world about us that is living in sin, is that we think that we're going to go directly from this to this, and we'll be able to see it easily. But I want to share something with you as we leave these two up here, that oftentimes in life, that as we go through life, uh, it, it's not as simple as going from one extreme to the other. But as we're living our lives, we make decisions. And for sometimes our, our young people, our young families, they make a couple of decisions and they don't think it really has that big of an impact on their life. And I'm drinking it because what I'm about to put in it may lift up the level here just a little bit. And so we make decisions in our lives. And this isn't just for, for young families, for, for young people. But this is for all of us. And we don't think they make that big of a deal. And so maybe some friends invite you out to a movie. Or you're going to read a book and people encourage you that it's probably not the best decision for you. But you do it anyway. And as sometimes kids tell me, it's got some language and some violence in it, but it's not that big of a deal. It's got a couple of scenes in it, but I can overlook that. There's some words in the music, but I don't even listen to them. It doesn't bother me that much. And so we deposit that into our mind. And we really can't see it that well. It's at the bottom. It still looks pretty clean. And so then maybe we're around people that gossip or do some things that we know that God really doesn't want us to do. And so we then put that into our water bottle. And we want God to be okay with all this because after all, it's not that big of a deal. And then maybe we involve ourselves in some gossip. But we really didn't say anything that bad. And, and it wasn't that bad of a thing. We were just kind of talking. And so we then deposit that into our water bottle. And on and on and on it goes until we take this and we offer it to God and we say, God, here's me. But then whenever you shake it up, what are we giving to God? We're giving to God something that's dirty, something that's not what he is asking us to be. And so as you see on your outline, whenever we live in sin... We're asking God to drink dirty water. Have you ever thought about yourself asking God to drink dirty water? God wants us to be clean. God wants us to be whole, not so much because we are, but because that's the condition that Christ has given us to be. Because he's cleansed us, he's washed us anew, and yet sometimes this is what we give to God. And we say, hey God, Jesus washed me from my sins, so here I am. Is this the kind of water you want to drink? Is this what you want whenever you want a clean glass of water? God wants us to be clean and righteous. And so as you look at your outline and as we walk through this, now I'm used to seeing my lesson, so I'm going to have to look back ever so often. First, we're going to look at our mindset in Colossians 3 and verse 1. And what I'm going to share with you is we're going to kind of get an idea here of what the context is before we jump into Colossians 3 and verse 5. God first tells us here about our mindset and what our mindset needs to be. And so he shares with us 
Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And so we all of a sudden come to this, this reality. And the reality is that since you've been raised to a new life with Christ, your life is different. Your mindset should be different. Philippians 2 and verse 5, which has been preached on. And so how you move forward is different than how you move forward in the past. You're going to think different. You're going to react different. You're going to live different. And so this heavenly walk goal that God gives to us through Paul includes walking away from all that is earthly within us. I want you to think for a moment in your life today, some of the decisions that you've made and some of the things that you struggle with on a daily basis that really kind of feed that earthly person that you are. I want you to think for a moment about those decisions that you make and those things that challenge you. Do you have those things in your mind right now? And I think it's very important for us to recognize that as I look at some of you that are 65, 70 and up, and then you look at some folks that are, that are middle-aged with families, and then as I look at this group over here, however old you guys are, you know, you've got three different groups of realities, of places in life of what those lists are going to be. Some of you may say, hey, I don't struggle with movies because I don't watch movies. Well, these do. I assume you do. <laughs> and then you've got some that, that maybe, as one of our speakers mentioned, you watch the news. And you feel like the news keeps you updated. Boy, the news is negative, isn't it? I turn the news on, and you know what I do? I turn it back off. Murder and death and shootings and stuff happening on the other side of the world that's as negative as it could be. Now, I don't want that stuff in my head, so I don't watch it. So we need to be careful of what we put in our minds because this heavenly walk goal includes walking away from things that are earthly. And so we find that as a result, our goal is to do a couple of things. Our goal is to do a couple of things, and we're going we're gonna to look at these. As a result, our goal is to desire righteousness and pure hearts. We are called by God to desire righteousness and pure hearts. Matthew chapter 5, verses 6 and 8 tells us, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are desiring to walk with God. You're going to be filled. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be pure. God calls us to make that our goal. Not just so that we can be religious, but so that we can be godly, so that we can be heaven bound. We also find as a result of this goal is not to pretend to love, but to love sincerely. Have you ever found yourself sometime pretending to love? You know, like putting on a, putting on a front? Now, I'm going to answer the question for you, <laughs> and the answer is yes. And you know how I know the answer is yes for you? Because you're human. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None are righteous, Romans 3 and verse 10 says. We all fall short. So we all pretend at some time or another. We all fail in this area at some time or another. But what God calls us to do is not so much not to fail, but he calls us to aspire toward heavenly living. Aspire toward this love that he calls us to. And so he also calls us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Don't be like the world, but go after this higher calling. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed as your mind continually renews. And I want to tell some of our young people, I want to tell some of those that are maybe the, the 18 to 26. I've talked to a number of people in, in my uh, preaching life that will, will tell me they feel like that whenever they sin, that, that they have this, this wall now between them and God. And they feel so bad and they feel so awful about it. But praise be to God. You know, when, when Romans, uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, he said, the things that I want to do, I find myself not doing. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing those things. Do you remember how Paul ends Romans chapter 7? 
What shall I do with this circumstance that I'm in, this, this conundrum that I'm in? And the answer isn't Paul. The answer is praise be to God. Because through Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of sin. Through Jesus Christ, we have this renewal and this transformation. And so God calls us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind every day. When we wake up, we need to recognize we've got a new day of growth, a new day of learning, a new day of renewal that God gives to us. Praise God for that. Aren't you thankful for that? Well, I know I am. Because I know me, and I know the areas where I'm challenged. And I'm thankful that we serve a merciful and a kind God that looks at me and knows what I'm trying, knows what I'm working on being renewed. And he renews me, and he forgives me. Well, the next thing we want to look at now is our momentum. Our momentum. And with this momentum, look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. Well, let's finish reading Colossians 3 and verse 1. Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits on the place of honor at God's right hand. And so think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died, here we are, the momentum. You died, and Christ, you died to this life. And your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And so, as we consider the, maybe the, the lying or the, uh, the challenges that we walk through, maybe it's the pride that we have, the selfishness that we have. Maybe it's the fact that we don't think a lot about ourselves, and we struggle with that sin. Well, God tells us that whenever we're baptized into Christ and we come out of that water, we come out a, a new creation. We come out a new person. We come out as a new life, Romans 6 and verse 5 and 6 tells us. And so this momentum that started at baptism needs to continue every day. As Maxie mentioned, as my wife and I have a, a real love and passion for evangelism, you see, one of the great things about evangelism isn't just going and telling someone they're in sin, but it's letting them know that you can live a life of freedom in Christ. You can live a life where you're renewed every day. What if I struggle with alcoholism? God can help you with that. What if I struggle with, and you list off the things that they're challenged by, and you remind them God can renew you, God can forgive you, God can help you with that. Because we serve a merciful and a God of abundant love, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us. And after your baptism, you are raised into heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That same Christ Jesus that walked out of the tomb, the same Christ Jesus that died for you, the same Christ Jesus that loved you, that Christ Jesus every day renews you. And so you gain this momentum and so as Christians, we can pinpoint the time and the day that we became citizens of heaven. Do you remember the day that you became a Christian? Do you remember the day that you were washed into the blood of Jesus Christ? I remember that day for me. I remember it very vividly. I remember the day that, that I baptized both my sons by the glory of God. I remember that day that their lives were changed. They, they both came out of the water with a different look on their face and by God's great grace, I was able to be there to watch that. This momentum that we have, that we can pinpoint that day. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 says that the, the circumcision of the flesh is not what changes us. It's the circumcision by the Spirit that changes us. It's not a fleshly thing. It's a spirit thing when God changes us and we start that momentum forward. And so we find then that this momentum is fully invested in Jesus' blood and his resurrection from the dead. Now just to camp out here for a few minutes, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that there are three principles that transform lives, that transforms the church. And that's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It changes everything. And when that tomb that day was empty, and sometime later we find Peter preaching that lesson for the church, and they asked him, what should we do to be saved? And, and his answer wasn't, well, you're out of luck. 
His answer was, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Game changer. Then momentum began because we find that this momentum is fully invested in Jesus' blood. You are saved today and a child of God not just because of the crucifixion, but also because of the resurrection. In fact, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus died a normal man on the cross. See, we need to be sharing with people as they are struggling with sin, as they are challenged by sin, and whether these people are outside of the church or whether these people are Christians and they're struggling with sin, that because of the resurrection... That begins momentum for us. And the sins that we have, the sins that we struggle with, Jesus can powerfully help us. He can give us renewal. He can give us strength. And I tell you, the people that God has given me grace to study with, that He's blessed me and my wife to work with, and you get to watch renewal. You get to watch a resurrection of the Spirit whenever people learn God's love for them and they are baptized into Christ and they come out of the water and you can see in their eyes they're changed, they're renewed. And you can see that momentum start. I forgot to mention my wife at the beginning of my lesson and what an amazing, amazing credit she's been to our ministry. And I wish every one of you could meet her and just, just kind of enjoy her. She's an amazing woman, an amazing mother. And it's been such a blessing that I'm not just the one studying with people, but we're there together as a force. The energy and the spirit and the love there for the souls of people. Brethren, we need to make sure as we sit before people that we are sharing with them that, yes, they are living in sin. Yes, they're involved in sin, but there is a God and a Christ who loves them and who wants them to be brought back. Sometimes I think we honestly make baptism and the whole conversion process too difficult. It's been something that's been on my mind for a number of years now, that as I talk with other men and, and we talk about, uh, you know, doing this and doing this and making sure about this and having these conversations. And, you know, as I've studied with a number of people, something that's come to my mind is, are we making this too hard? What does it take to become a child of God and a Christian? They recognize they have sin, and they recognize in Jesus Christ and through baptism, those sins can be washed away. That's what it takes to become a child of God. So the Bible says those people in, in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, what must we do to be saved? Well, we need to have certain conversations, and we need to make sure that if you're doing this, you stop, and we need to make... And we go through these conversations. What did Peter tell them? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And after they repented and they were baptized into Christ, what did that make them? Made them Christians. Made them children of God. A number of people that I've worked with, they've been very surprised when I tell them, you, you become a Christian, a child of God, and you're saved. And they're amazed. And what a blessing it is to walk down that path with them. And so now we come to our, to our lesson this morning of our dual mission. Our dual mission as God's children. So beginning in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, or evil desires. Do not be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. And because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of the world. But now, now, what a great transition for Paul, but now. So you've come out of the water. You've been raised to a new life. Romans chapter 6 explains the whole process. And he says, but now. Coming out of the water is a game changer. Coming out of the water is a life changer. Coming out of the water changes everything. Your sins are washed away. And now those things that you were going to struggle with in your life, whatever your things are that you struggle with, 
As we come out of the water now, we have the Holy Spirit to renew us and to strengthen us. We have the blood of Jesus Christ that every time we sin, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 gives us a great promise. And it says that whenever we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with Him. And the blood of Jesus Christ... Isn't that great news? The blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from what? All unrighteousness. I wonder sometimes if the message to those that are lost and those that are new Christians is that there are some sins that are harder for God to forgive. I don't know that we've ever said that, but sometimes that's the message. That's sometimes what I hear from people. You know, I know He can forgive me for lying and this, but boy, I did a whopper, and I don't know that God could forgive me. No, 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 no. All unrighteousness. God will take care of all of that. He forgives us from all of that. And so verse 8, but now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. And so God tells us, Paul tells us, about our dual mission. Paul speaks of our dual mission as individual Christians. You see, this, when you were baptized, is what God made you. <clears throat> see, I think it's important for us to have a visual. This is what, you, you went into the water like this. And as some of our young people say today, ew. Do y'all say that still? Do y'all say that? Kids I'm around say it. Ew. That's what we went into the water with. This is what we came out of the water. Into the water, out of the water. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus Christ, in, out. And so God says, once I've made you clean, don't go back to this. Work very hard to find out what your weaknesses are, what your sins are, what you're challenged with, what buttons does Satan push. And don't go back into that life. This dual mission we have is of putting off the old, continuing to put off the old. Sometimes I think we think that at baptism we put it off and it stays off. It's like we chain it to the water. Has anybody found that to be the case? <laughs> Has anybody found that to be the case where at baptism you chain your sins to the water, you chain your old behavior to the water and you just walk away? And you never have to deal with those things again. Anybody found that to be the case? Yeah, me neither. In fact, we sometimes invite those things, don't we? God tells us this dual mission is that we need to stay pure as Christians. And so this mission that God has given to us is for a couple of things. We are for self-holiness. 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 15, God calls us to be holy as He is holy. And so we are to continue to walk in self-holiness. Now that self-holiness, don't get me wrong, it's not my holiness. But God wants me to be holy to represent Him. And you see, part of the reason God wants us to be holy to represent Him. In chapter 2 and verse 9 of 1 Peter... It calls us a priesthood, a holy nation, a people that are beloved and known by God. And then it gives us our purpose. It says, so that you can sing the praises of Him who loved you and the world around you. You see, God doesn't want us just to be holy so that, no, so we can say we're holy. God wants us to be holy so when we leave these doors or people come into these doors, they can see the shining light of Jesus. They can see what God has done in us. I've talked to a number of people that come out of the world and they come into a place like this, any church pretty much in the south, and they look at all of us and you know what they say? I could never be perfect like you. And that's what people are saying. If you haven't done evangelism in a long time, that's what they're saying. I can't be perfect like you. Now, the response to that is, well, I'm not perfect either. Jesus enables me to be perfect. We need to make sure we get that message out that we're not perfect either. Now, we may look good. 
and we've got our suits and our coats and our dresses on, we may look good, but we are by no means perfect outside of Jesus Christ. The mission we have is for self-holiness. It's for self-purity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, in the last part of chapter 6, Paul details really what God's promises for us are. That essentially we'll be his children. He'll be our father. And in chapter 7 and verse 1, he then goes on to say that you need to, to purify yourself from all the things that are putrid in life. Purify your body and your spirit for the glory of God. Self-holiness, self-purity, and then self-assessment. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul says that we need to examine ourselves. Much like in James, when, when James tells us that a man that walks by the mirror, now most men don't walk by the mirror and really take really much notice. I know one person that does, but most don't. And so as you walk by the mirror, you know, and let's say I walk by the mirror and... And I look like this. Now, number one, my wife would never let me out of the house like this. But number two, if I, if I walk up to you like this, you would kind of go, um, um, Brother Burns, um, what? I don't, I don't see a problem. Sometimes we walk by the spiritual mirror. We, we read the Bible. We study the Bible. And we look at these things and we say, nah, that's okay. God says we need self-assessment. God desires that... We be filtered by His Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 through 21 talks about our flesh versus our spirit. It mentions the works of the flesh that we all struggle with. And then it mentions the fruit of the Spirit. And it says these are things that you need to be working toward. The love and the peace and the joy and the kindness. These aren't things that come naturally to us. These are things that we add whenever we walk in Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1 and about verse 5 gives us a list as well. Add to your faith these different elements. And so we need to be filtered by the Holy Spirit with the mindset of Jesus. And so I want to ask you this morning, as you consider your life, what are your blind spots? And what that means is maybe you're, you're struggling with pride and you don't know it. Everybody around you knows it, but you don't know it. Maybe you struggle with gossip and people try to tell you. And in fact, people leave conversations and you're clueless. Maybe you struggle with bitterness and you can't get out of your own way because you're bitter about a, a conversation or a decision or maybe a decision God made in your life. Maybe you're struggling with, and you name it, whatever the issue is that you struggle with, are you aware of those things? That's why Paul... Had, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, hey, you need to examine yourself. What do, you, what do you struggle with? What are your issues in life? We need to recognize that as we do evangelism, that people are struggling with all kinds of things. All kinds of issues they're dealing with. And somehow we want to go to them, study the Bible, baptize them into Christ, and they're going to be just like us. And they're not going to struggle with a whole lot. We got people out there in the world right now in your own backyard that are struggling with adultery and, and struggling with lust and struggling with alcoholism and they're, they're doing all kinds of things. And we somehow want to put them in water and bring them back up and they're good to go. We don't want to work with them and love them through those things. We need to help them learn what the holiness and the purity of God is and what they're struggling with and, and be patient with them like God's patient with us. And so which one of these spirit-sided areas affects your walk with God? Which one of these areas that, in fact, Paul listed here? Put to death the earthly things that are lurking in you. Verse 5, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy. A greedy person is an idolater. Worshiping the things of the world. You used to be like that, the rage, the anger, the malicious behavior. Don't do that anymore. Work toward walking with God and being holy. Paul encouraged Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22 to pursue righteous things. Get away from the worldly things and pursue righteousness. When we look at verse 10, Paul, kind of like a great conductor, emphasizes then that 
as a Christian, put on. It's in the continual mode. Keep putting on. Every day that you wake up, put on Jesus Christ. Put on the Holy Spirit as a mindset, as a behavior for each one of us. Put on your new self that's created in Christ Jesus. And so what efforts are you giving today to keep your water bottle clean? You know, for our young people, there's some, some movies oftentimes out there that, that uh, as, they're, as they're going along, and I'm watching the preview, and I'm going, please be PG-13. My wife and I decided a number of years ago that if it's rated R, it doesn't matter what it is, if it's R, if the world rates it R, we're not going to mess with it. Doesn't mean we're perfect. It means we've made a decision. And so we're sitting there, please don't be our, please don't be our. And it comes up in the trailer. And I'm like, man, I wanted to watch that. Now the problem is if I go through all that and I want it to be R and it's PG-13, should I still watch it? Maybe not. And the really cool thing is our kids are sitting there and as they're watching a movie and they're going through it, my, my, my youngest son's a little bit more vocal about his thoughts and my older son's a little more quiet. So they're sitting there going, please, 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 man, and it's rated R. We're not going to watch it. Because rated R movies generally will take our mind from efforting toward this, trying to be this, and it just slowly makes us like this. Music we listen to, books that we read, people that we are around, all those things affect the nature of our water bottle, of our mind. And so this morning, this afternoon, at 11 o'clock, whatever the time of day is, <laughs> how are you trying to set the realities of heaven in your everyday walk? Very quickly, before we go on to our next point, and uh, I'm doing good, Maxie, time-wise, I'm, I'm watching. I want to ask you this morning, oftentimes Satan has this way, especially as a preacher, as a Sunday school teacher, you know that we, we just kind of go on cruise. You may still be reading your Bible, but we just kind of go on cruise control. And, and an invisible raise of hands, how many of you all have found yourself sometimes to be on cruise control? You know? You, you just kind of, you're a good person. You go to church, Bible class, you read your Bible. But I don't know if there's a real effort for us to really strive for the mindset of Christ, for a heavenly focus. To, to continue to raise the bar of how we're going to live and decisions we're going to make and how we're going to be perceived by the world around us. I mean, after all, you're a preacher. Now, preacher students don't fall into this mode. Continue to strive. Continue to work. If you're not in the preaching field, keep plugging away. Keep wanting and efforting to be close to Jesus. Do not allow yourself to go on cruise control. What are the areas in your life that Satan tugs on to encourage your mind and walk to be earth-based? Now, the interesting thing about this is none of us can say, really nothing, I don't have anything. Well, you're lying to yourself. We all have them, every one of us, because Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None are righteous. We all struggle. So what areas of your life does Satan tug on in order to keep us earth-based? To wrap this all up this morning, we find that our mindset needs to be in Jesus. And oftentimes, years after baptism, our mindset needs to continue to come back to Jesus. Our momentum is justification. Every day that I wake up, every walk, that step that I take, I am justified by the blood of Christ, by the empty tomb, and I praise God for that. And my mission every day is to put off the old, put on the new, put on the aspects of renewal in the Spirit. And so you see, for us, it's not always a question of will you sin or can you sin. It's a question of how you're living your life. Jesus wants you to know that He lives in you. Are you living in Him? Is He a part of your life today that's not just... Scripture, and it's not just attendance, it's a lifestyle that we live every day so that the world can see how we live and can desire to live that same way, to follow Jesus every day. May God bless us as we do this. May God bless us as we make this effort to have this mission in our lives, 
to be like Jesus so the world can see that. We can be a strong church and people can be attracted to the blood and the life in Jesus. Thank you.